it's so good and healthy to be reminded of about how things happen in our country. The Kerner Commission was a watershed moment, right? And to hear Fred Harris tell the story of how he and another legislator put forth this resolution and then realized that they could actually get it into the hands of the president. They didn't need congressional action. And then how that led to presidential movement, if you will, to create the commission. I mean, that's, that's an important civics lesson for us all. Now, not unlike the Clinton Commission on Race, which died as well after they finished their work, you know, this one died after it was finished, so to speak. But although it became a bestseller, you know, the, the action, if you will, the legislative action didn't happen. But, it, but you still have this codified record of the reality of racial hierarchy as, as it's never been captured before in terms of the Kerner Commission. You had, it wasn't as thorough in the Clinton Commission, but those of us who care about these issues, we have built on that work. We stand on the shoulders of a Fred Harris and all those who were involved. And so it was exciting to be here today. It was exciting to see how many people were in the audience to see the multi-generational approach to this work, which was, we have to have that. Uh, so it was a good experience. I'm very honored to have been invited. The last uh, body of work that I was privileged to design uh, with the Kellogg Foundation is called Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. It is an adaptation of the globally recognized Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, or TRC process. But we knew we had to create something for America that speaks to our unique history. To say reconcile or come back together, as some places might do after a great conflict, is not adequate. It's not appropriate here, because we were never together. This country was conceived and built on the embedded notion of a hierarchy of human value. It's in the DNA of every system and structure that we have and it's deeply embedded in the unconscious minds of almost everyone. And so to say that we need to reconcile, one could philosophically carry that, but truthfully we need to heal because that is harmful. This idea that we can divide humanity into a hierarchical categories based on physical characteristics, it is harmful to our spirit, to our bodies. It's harmful to our relationships. So there has to be healing from that. But then we have to transform our way of being with one another. We have to find the ability to, to experience the humanity of everyone. And it's more than empathy. It's compassion. And it's experiencing and embracing the humanity of all. So often I tell people, you know, we have to connect to the perceived other. The other is not really, they're not really an other, but we perceive them as an other. And that transformational work is a work of consciousness. It's a work of spirit. People do what they do because they're motivated to do it. And motivations are usually feelings. You know, they're not, I'm doing this because of that victory over there. I'm doing this because of the amount of money I'm going to make. I'm doing it. No, usually people, great leaders motivate people when they touch their feelings. Even the, the great leaders in the tech world, they, they have motivated their company based on the, the big vision of what they're doing to transform the world. The levels of brutality and hatred that accompanied the centuries of denial of the humanity of both indigenous and African people. It's an anathema to who we think we are as a country. And facing that reality is frightening and it's hard. And it's better to act like it didn't exist. It's better to deny it or to project and say that the problem is theirs it's not the problem of the broader society. And so we have to be smarter in creating ways to heal that, to bring people together, to give them the space to reconcile, if you will, that painful history and move on and transform 
our expectations of our culture and of our people. Um, but America has to do this work. We will not survive as a viable democracy if we don't do this. I don't believe we will. There's wonderful work going on all over this country. We have communities applying the truth, racial healing, and transformation work. Uh, it's a five-part framework, narrative change, racial healing, dealing with separation and segregation, changing our laws and changing the way our, our legal systems work, particularly our criminal justice systems, and then making concrete efforts to change our economy, our economic realities. That's the five-part framework. People are doing that work. Unfortunately, it's a well-kept secret, you know, and we only hear the bad news, you know. We don't hear and we don't amplify the voices of all these wonderful people in this country who have committed to creating a better future. And that, that's a work that I'm doing in my new role. Uh, I left uh, Kellogg Foundation in the in, uh, end of August. And uh, I want to continue to be a champion for and support and elevate and amplify this important work uh, through the center I've created in Maryland, the Intianu Center for Healing and Nature. The Great Cities Institute here at UIC uh, is modeling um, for the world, and they, I think they're leveraging communications very nicely to say that the Kerner Commission was important and is important. To have brought together all of these wonderful people, both the, the authentic community voices as well as the policy-making voices, the Chicago voices and the national voices, to have brought us all together to interact with the next generation, which are students. You know, part of the TRHT effort is being implemented on campuses around this country. So that's another reason why I was so excited to be here, because the institutions that are training our leaders for the future, this has to be part of the curriculum. This has to be part of the message that young people are getting while they're still young enough to receive it. I have children that are millennial age and older and, and you know, and they're very active and they say, Mom, we're the resistance. And I'm, no, you minimize your power by describing yourself as the resistance. That's the resistance. This backsliding that you see is the resistance to all the progress that we have made and are making. So don't minimize your position by describing yourself as the resistance. You are, in fact, the force for change, and you are part of that force, and we will succeed.